Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, so for the last talk of my block for this session, before we break for tea, uh, we have Kim Ava from EA's DICE here to talk about re uh, realism versus stylization. So good luck. Thank you. Well. <laughs> so many people, thank you for coming here and uh, listening to my talk. Let's get started. So I'm uh, Kim Ava, and uh, like all speakers usually do, it's like this is my history. And currently, I'm working as a lead environment artist at Dice. I've been working in the industry around 10 years now, and uh, it all started out as a game design student in university. And then uh, I went on to have a short internship with Might and Delight. Worked on a game that got never released, but experience is experience, right? And then uh, I continue studying at Future Games, where I also, at the same time, freelanced for the Solus project. And then I moved on to uh, work at Guerrilla Games on the first Horizon Zero Dawn. And then from there, I tried uh, my hands on some uh, VR development. And uh, then for the past five years, I've been with DICE, working on uh, the two latest Battlefield games. So that's a bit about me. I usually do some talks as well and podcasts. It's always fun, but at the same time, it seems like my nerves are always still the same. So that's not getting better with time. But hopefully, the content is. So today, we're going to start off with talking about Gestalt principles. And then we're going to dive into realism, stylization, do a comparison, and end with a conclusion. So this is a little bit different from the uh, articles I've written back in the days that this talk is uh, all based on. So let's go back a bit in time, roughly 100 years, actually now, to 1920s, to these three gentlemen, which are all psychologists. And now you're probably wondering, what do they have to do with art? But these psychologists, Max, uh, Wolfgang, and Kurt, they developed the Gestalt Principle. They wanted to better understand how our brain works and interprets the visual chaos of our world. So the Gestalt principle consists of a group of theories, sometimes also referred to as laws, that explains how our minds organize, interpret, and process visual information. So that's how they are in this talk. The principle explains how we visualize specific elements of the real world and how our minds find order and organization. So this principle is commonly used a lot in product design and logotypes and uh, UX, UI, and so on. And I also apply it to when I'm making games. So the Gestalt principle is based on the idea that the human brain will attempt to simplify and organize complex images, designs, and so on. Our brains are built to see structure and patterns. Uh, and in order for us to understand our environment better that we live in, and this is going back to like when we are hunters and gatherers, is like a safety net. So this principle basically explains that our visual input rather as perceive whole shapes and figures than disconnected edges and lines. So there's a lot of different individual principles commonly associated with the Gestalt principle or like the theory. But we will not go into uh, too much details of any of them, uh, but only a few of them that are of interest for us as game developers, and that are figuring round continuation, closure, pregnance, and past experience. So it's hard to say how, exactly how many of these principles exist nowadays, because new ones have emerged, as well as some of these principles goes by other names than the ones that I've listed here today as well. So the first one, we perceive what we expect. So this is our past experience is all based on our own personal experience, culture, and time period we are growing up in. So our brains have a limit on our attention, making us more prone to take paths or do things that are familiar to us as it takes less effort. And that's because our brain is very lazy. So recognition is easy for the brain as it relies on past information. So if we do an example here, imagine that you're an architect and you're handed this building plan. What you see is black silhouettes against a white background, and that is like the silhouette of a top-down projection of buildings. Now imagine instead that you're working with advertisement, and you are handed the exact same picture, and it says the life, or the word life, in there. 
So depending on the experience, you will either see this building map or you will now see a word life in there. And for those who can't see the word life, it's in the white. So let's move on to current context or like the present. So English speaker will read this as the, as a normal uh, would be, and then the H in CHT as cat, so it would say the cat. And that's because if you know English, we know that this is a word, so your brain will automatically help you out here. But if you're not an English speaker, this might just look like CHT, as you lack the context or the word uh, and the meaning behind it. So the next one, our goal. So when we're looking for information, we are very goal-oriented. We screen and scan for specific information, and we often don't notice other information that comes along. So now I'd like you to pretend that you are helping me building some IKEA furnitures. And I'm from Sweden, so of course, that's what we do. And uh, I ask you to go and fetch me a scissor, because we're going to get the package open. And uh, you go into my kitchen, because that's where I have my tools. Let's pretend that that's where everyone has their tools. And you go in, you open the drawer, you grab the scissor, and you get back to me. And you hand me the scissor, and then I'm like, oh, yeah, right. We need a ruler as well, because, you know, we're going to have to make things straight. And I ask you, was there a ruler in there as well? Now, most people, or most adults, will not be able to really answer that question, because we are so goal-oriented and focused on our task that we might miss other things that come along with it. But kids and some people with certain conditions, they are not as focused as, uh, like, many other people might be. They actually see other things around you. So they would be able to tell you that there is a rule in there. And a kid would probably also be able to tell you that there's all sorts of tools in there that you might need as well. And they might also take a little bit longer time than you did to fetch me the scissor. So figuring round, this one is quite known already. It's the most common one as a composition tool that we're using. The principle describes how a visual system structure and separate the visual field into the figure, the foreground, and the ground, which is the background. Essentially using contrast and color theory, typically in between foreground and background. The figure is the primary attention, and the ground can be anything and everything else. So we use this to attract attention to important information or option we like the player to pay attention to first. The background can temporarily become the figure, if it's made to grab the attention, and the other way around. We usually see this temporary switch in games, uh, such as quest marker, collectibles, HUD changes, damage taken, attacks, and so on. And in this image here, you can either see two human faces facing each other, or you will see in the middle a vase, depending on your context switching. Figure and ground principle also why we talk about the importance of a strong silhouette when making characters and hero pieces, VFX and animation and so on. It's basically figure and ground in many levels and layers in everything we do. So continuation. Our brain assumes a lot based on previous um, and current experiences. Our brains are pattern makers and we perceive patterns even when they're not there. Our instincts tell us to follow a path, a river, a fence, or something that is like a line. And we will continue to look in that direction or move in that direction until we decide it was something of significant to see or it was nothing of interest. Same with textures and materials like the uh, brick and wall plaster you have here. We continue to look that direction until we are past the edge or the corner, and we will assume it continues the, uh, like around it. So this principle is about the tendency to resolve ambiguity and fill in missing data, basically meaning that our minds are biased to perceive continuous forms instead of the disconnected segments. So in this screenshot from the Red Dead Redemption 2, while we do not see the continuation of a road or a railway beyond the horizon or canvas, or in this case, the monitor, we can assume that it uh, goes beyond of what we can see and what we're looking at. Same with the planks underneath the gravel. We assume there to be planks connecting even if it's covered in gravel. So we as game developers usually see this in level design, like the continuation aspect, to point a player in the right direction or give a hint. And then we have this pragnance and 
it's German, so I'm not going to be able to pronounce that correctly. But our brain prefers things that are simple, clear and in order. Uh, less time to process, which means less dangerous surprises and less dangerous uh, threats. So our mind likes it when it's symmetrical and forming around a center point, which is easier to process for the brain. So when confronted with complex shapes, we tend to reorganize them into simpler components or simpler holes. So this is the Olympic logo, but flipped. So reality is reduced to its simplest form. Uh, so in this case, with the five circles, instead of seeing complex shapes like the image next to it, because that's very hard for a brain to process, we will just see five circles, either connected or on top of each other. So pregnancy is not only symmetry and order, it's simplicity. And we will get back to that a bit later. Uh, closure. This is our mind's ability to fill in the blank, to complete an unfinished figure or form, subject and missing pieces. If we have enough of an indication of a shape as a viewer, you will accept the fact that the forms are completed outside of what you actually can see. So we do this with text in languages as well. So if you can read that bubble, and you can read the text, you will know that, well, this is our brain filling in the blanks for us, because even though it's completely misspelled, and that's because our experience tells us that we know English, so you should be able to read it anyway. So the World Wildlife Fund logo as well, the panda you see, is also a good example of closure. Uh, you will not really see the lines being completed in this logo, like there is no, nothing connecting the head or the back. But your brain will close in on that anyway, because it's not like you're going to assume that it has a mohawk or a magic hat or something popping up from the head. You will just see it as its uh, closed shape. Same with this painting by John Metzinger. You will see a lot of disconnected lines, but your mind will fill in the blanks for you. So actually, you see trees, a river, perhaps, and some bushes on the ground. And the last principle we'll walk through is um, well, basically, that we see like all visual inputs and perceive it as part of uh, our life. As game developers, it's our main objective to present visual information in a way that helps uh, our players to move around in our games, making them understand what they see and stay immersed in whether it's being realistic or stylized game graphics. So the Gestalt principle are usually uh, rules describing individual parts that makes up a whole. So anyone who, like, watch the recording later, you can go and look at this image and figure out all of those theories because they are in there and see how that applies um, as an exercise. So now we're diving into realism, the thing that you actually came here for. So what is realism? Uh, what do we mean when we talk about uh, realism and how do we perceive something to be realistic? So realism is trying to mimic life uh, and mimic life like objects. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has to exist in real life, but it needs to look like it would fit into our world. So like Star Wars uh, and the universe is not really something that exists in our world, but it's made to look like it actually could. So realism has always been something we strive for since a long time ago. It has always felt super realistic to us when it first came out as well. So what we thought to be lifelike a couple of years to the, uh, ago, today we say is kind of outdated and not very realistic. Might even say it looks stylized in comparison of today's standards. And this will continue change as well. And what we think is lifelike and realistic today, we will not be thinking that it is in an additional 10 years or so. So this is actually the same process as the film industry went through and is continuously going through. All CGI gets very realistic when it was first shown. It's like, wow, it's never been realistic as this, right? Uh, but then today we look back at those movies and we probably even laugh because it looks really silly uh, and really unrealistic. So all games in this slide are very well known for realism, like today and a few years ago. Uh, Red, Dead, Red Dead Redemption 2, Horizon, Last of Us, and Cyberpunk. But what elements make a game look and feel realistic? It's not only the objects and textures we have on them that make something look and feel realistic. It's the lighting, atmosphere, material definition, animation, weather, sound, everything adds to how you perceive it to be realistic. So 
This is basically enhanced realism as the colors and light, atmosphere, they are more vibrant and they have the perfect weather and lighting condition. It's like an escape from reality, as real life can be very dull and boring. So what we as artists mimic is actually enhanced reality as opposed to uh, realistic everyday life. And we do this with everything, and we do this actually all the time. And we do this with social media filters and vacation pictures. You'd rather visit the bottom um, for a vacation stay than the top one, which is actually probably more representative of what it looks like there in a cloudy day. And we do this in movies and commercials and photos. We really need to convince people that it looks and feels real, like something you want for commercial or like a movie that you're immersed in this reality. So for this uh, movie, to convince someone that it looks really, really cold, they add the atmosphere and lighting, uh, color and you know, hue changes to make it look it feel like it's indeed a cold and daunting place. And for games then, we have a lot of game tech like considerations and limitations and also gameplay to consider, or game design, or sometimes legal and copyright infringements, and you know, the list goes on. But we can still get very close to the original without copying it one-to-one. -one. Um, and in this image, you have the same ar arches, you have the same pillars, trims, shapes with figures, and so on. But it, it's still slightly different. Um, and for the record, I don't really know why. Like this game in particular is not like one-to-one, -one, but I believe that any of the uh, you know, mentioned reasons could be a cause for it. And this is also used to add another comparison of not having a one-to-one -one, uh, translation of a real-life location. Uh, but people who visited and, or know the place, they will still look in, uh, feel like it's a real-life location when you're playing the game, because you still have the most iconic things represented in there, even though it's still you know, not a one-to-one -one or the exact copy. And these two games are also known for their realistic approaches. They both have uh, differences in atmosphere, lighting, and colors. They're very different from one each other. But both are enhancing elements and ex exaggerating them in a way. And it's almost coming stylization in itself, which brings us to the next category, which is stylization. So what identifies stylization? Uh, it's like the word indicate. It's something that depicts a certain style, but it's non-realistic. It's been stripped from all small and fiddly details. It's a simplified way of representing objects and game graphics, and it plays on shape and form. Uh, you will recognize a barrel and a stone, even though it has a flat gray texture, because you have a past experience of seeing a barrel or a stone. If you hadn't before, then it might be even, you know, a bit hard to tell what the object is. So stylization isn't just something we use to talk about art in games. Stylization is pragnance. It's simply like the basics of what we see. So stylization look to many at first glance to be much simpler to make than realistic game graphics. But if you dwell a bit deeper into the subject, you will start to notice that it's quite complex as it's based on real life and realism in a way. You need artists to have a cohesive and strong understanding of color, design, and shape and form. So stylus is a bit tougher to define than realism, as it can look in many different ways. As you can see in these images, they're very different from each other, and they're not like mimicking real life. So you can't be like, oh, that's realistic or not, uh, because it's playing on shape and form. But they're all known for their, uh, their stylization, um, but they're just very different. So stylized game art has also changed throughout time with tech advancements and so on. Like previously, stylization was a thing that you used to have lower try count. You couldn't maybe render shadows and lighting and stuff, so you painted it in. Like it was a way to make a game but still not go for realism. But that have changed quite significant with time. And now with tech like flourishing in general, like for realism, you can, as a stylized uh, game creator, still utilize exactly that new tech with PBR and uh, using nice reflections and so on to enhance the visual language. But with stylized, you're free to play with the color and shapes and exaggerate it even more than what uh, you can do with realistic uh, games. 
So stylized art also tends to age better, with many pixel art in 2D game looking good still, and Zelda the Wind Waker, uh, a 3D game, still stand the test of time, and so do World of Warcraft, many people still playing that. So one can draw like just a quick conclusion from that in general, that stylized art tends to stand stronger for a longer time, uh, in comparison with realistic game graphics that will still continue to evolve. But because uh, stylization is very complex, I've divided it into two categories to break this down a little bit more, which is minimalistic stylization and exaggerated stylization. So the first one, uh, I generally refer to the over-exaggerated stylization, because it plays a lot on shapes uh, where you enlarge details and focus less on the micro details to convey shapes and objects. Um, if you look at uh, the bottom image with the wood, you tend to remove all sorts of grain and noise and only focus on the shape and the colors. If you have simple ob objects, you might enlarge or remove them completely depending on if it's important for the object to have in order to convey the purpose to the player. But it's like the play on shapes and exaggeration that uh, these games are usually very well known for. And then you have the second category, the minimalistic stylization which is still, you know, play on shape and form and silhouette, but it's much, much more simple, and it's usually not exaggerating styles and shapes uh, in the same way. It's instead, with very few details and color information, shaping objects to, like, the minimum where you can still recognize it as, like, a stone or sand, a character, and so on. But the colors are almost very flat and doesn't really have that much detail or information. Uh, everything is conveyed in simple colors and shapes. But you will still, like, as I mentioned, recognize all of these based on your past experience. But it gets harder when you're doing alien-like objects because then you don't really have anything to draw your experience from. So this is just an image to show like minimalism and exaggeration in the exact same scene. Uh, they're both the same scene, in the, even though like a few things in the background have changed. And this is an example from a VR game that I used to work on, the Apex Construct. And this is us uh, testing out the styles for the game. Should we go with the minimalistic approach or the exaggerated one? And in the end, we went with the exaggerated stylization, as it felt better and more appealing with a VR headset on, because that's how you have to test the game eventually. But it still has the iconic like metal head and the uh, like structural uh, in this industrial feeling to it, even though a lot of things in the mood have changed in the scene. And this one is quite interesting, like stylization and realism, or semi-realism, or semi-stylation, or whatever you want to call it, the in-between one in the gray zone area, like the 50% of the both, that can be a bit tricky to get right. It can either be stylized proportion with realistic textures, or the other way around, realistic proportion with stylized textures. But the tricky one here is that you can easily hit the uncanny valley of it being like, is it realistic or is it stylized? Or did you maybe fail on hitting realism or fail on hitting stylized? That can be very tricky, but if you do get the right proportion and blend of it, it can create some really unique art styles and something that stands out uh, for your game. So I said we're going to back to pregnance, and we're doing that now. Like pregnance in references, like simplicity in references. So what is really important to convey in an object, and what is its function? Can it look silly or even completely like a different object if you enhance or simplify the wrong details? So recognition of shape and silhouette, or figuring ground, gets extra important with stylization. When you exaggerate to simplify the wrong details, that's when it gets harder for the player to relate to what they see. That's why it's best to study the real world when making stylization, instead of studying other stylization like artists, because it can be that they have um, like thought in a bit different way than what the object is actually trying to convey to a player. So, we are in the comparison section. If we look then at Spider-Man, who is quite an iconic uh, figure, and the most iconic things for him, like, and this is just me analyzing it, would be the colors, which is the blue and the red, the patterns, like with the web design on him, and the eyes being big, white, and black borders. So, you can go even further in 
stylization, minimalistic here, to uh, like only have the colors and maybe the eyes, and you will still recognize it as Spider-Man. Or you can go in the other direction and make it even more realistic, where you focus more on the material definition. And that's why I also have Darth Vader here as for a comparison, who has a very strong figure and ground, like the silhouette is very strong. It might not have that much color because it's black, but you will recognize the shape of the helmet and the cape, even if it just would be black and white. But this is to show that there can be a big difference in uh, material definition and reflections of materials, because in the realistic version, you see that there is a lot of um, micro noise surfaces in the fabric and very uh, like strong reflections on the helmet to show what material it is, while all of those things are gone in the stylized version, where it's more like it's not pure black, it's more bluish in the sense. Uh, but you still recognize it, as I said, as Darth Vader. It's just like a matter of what is important to convey for it to be realistic or for it to be stylized. And here's just a house. Um, it's just a house from Old Town in uh, Sweden. The right one is a paint over where you can see a lot of the details from the photo has been removed or enhanced or like, yeah. Like, it's just uh, to play around with shapes in general. But it can still be interpreted as realistic. It's just have larger shapes and, like, larger roof tiles. But if you go even further, uh, you can get it more stylized if you play a lot with the shapes. But you can still uh, feel like this is a stylized one or, like, the one in the between, uh, if you like. And that, that's how you can work with... Uh, like realism as uh, references, and then just push the shapes and forms until you feel like there's still a connection with the, um, the original reference. And this is to show a range. Uh, it's a stump, and most people have seen like a chopped off uh, tree before. Uh, and in this range, you can go even more realistic again, and you can even actually simplify it even more. So it's a matter of like trying to figure out what makes a stump like a stump. Uh, if it's the silhouette, or if it's the colors, or the texture. So if we draw from our past experience, we know that bark is usually darker brown, and if it chop, chop the tree off, the in, inwards, or like the inner wood, is usually lighter. And you see that represented throughout all of the images, and they all use the same uh, scene with the same lighting. And if we look at uh, Pragnans, then, like I said, you know, simplifying shapes, you can see that a lot of the bark texture is now gone, uh, or like the um, layers and micro uh, noise is gone in the stylized one in the middle, and then that's completely removed in the minimalistic one. And you can have an in-between these two as well. Uh, it's just like playing with the shapes. So you can do this on many different objects, like large, uh, like with the house, uh, middle ones like the tree here, and really, really small objects like a mandarin. Um, but there is like a case where if you go and push it really far and have it minimalistic, like with this orange just having flat colors, it might be that someone interprets it as a ball, because it's now just orange. So that's why it's key to still keep some things that you know you recognize with an object. And in this case, it would be key to keep the uh, green top um, still in the minimalistic one, as it will then look more like an orange or a mandarin. And if you too play too much with colors here and do a little bit more reddish, this will start looking like a tomato as well, because they are quite similar in shape. But when you go and look at the realistic one, a tomato is very, very flat. It doesn't really have that much, while an orange has all of these bumps. So that's why the stylized one here still keep a little bit of the bump, and you can do even more if you really want it to be noticeable that, well, this is indeed a fruit, uh, like a citrus fruit, and not a tomato. So it's important that you understand what you're looking at. And this one I added here to just show what surface noise looks like with the flakiness in bark, where you have layers and layers of things happening when it's just like in a grayscale. And in the stylized one, you can see all of that removed, and the bark pieces become bigger and more angular for this style. You see the same happening with the hole in the tree and the wood eye where everything is like enlarged and pushed in details. So we are at the conclusion then. Um, so the word 
Gestalt is German, and it means the way things have been put together. There's no exact translation, but reading about it, it usually has the meaning pattern or configuration. So the Gestalt principle helps us understand and organize elements in a frame in a straightforward and easy to understand manner. By using it in composition, or like when you're texturing materials and so on, we can capture the player's attention. And for us developers, it helps us look at the world and break it down into shapes and forms and getting to the actual style that we want, like with art direction. Our perception of what we will see will vary heavily depending on our culture, background, and our experience, many in which are very individual and country specific. In common examples like our colors, uh, when you look at a traffic light, red means stop, yellow means wait, and green means go for most people. And we use this as well like when we're talking about other things where red is usually error, green is good. And if we look then at other colors like white and black, that tends to be seen as pure versus evil, life versus death. In many other cultures, that can actually be the complete opposite, where well, black is life and white is death instead. So a famous misquote within Gestalt is the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Not sure if anyone's seen this. It might mean nothing to you as well, because it just feels like it's almost like a riddle. Uh, the actual quote is the whole is something else than the sum of its parts, which might not help someone either. But if we break it down, it basically means that if you can understand the parts of the theory, you can understand the whole. So in our case, if you understand the why and the how, you will be able to put it all together. You will be able to actually create something that are cohesive. Um, so this is, this is the last uh, page. By understanding what is the object's function, form, shape, and core, and what the unique characteristics of this object, and how you can convey its function to a player. Instead of the verses, it's actually just a unified approach of thinking, as it's based on the same foundation and core, the same theory. So I believe that any artist can work with both realism and stylization, because it's the same to our minds and same to our brains. So in the end, what you need to know as an artist is just the underlying principles and how you apply it, the how and the why, things behave the way they do. So before I end, I just want to mention that uh, some other resources. I've been writing about this for many years, and these articles have more information for animation and VFX as well. It's on the level 80. But I also want to highly recommend picking up this book which have a lot of Gestalt principles that are based on like UX and UI web design. But I read it as well and made me think in a completely different way. Um, the We Perceive What We Expect section that I was having in the beginning is all based on this book, Designing with the Mind in Mind. And in general, if you're interested in Gestalt principles for art, you just Google Gestalt principle and art, and that's it. And you will find a lot of useful information. So, thank you. Um, all right, I think we have some time for questions. So, if anyone's got a question, please raise your hand and I can throw something at you. Maybe I made everyone fall asleep and you're like, oh, <laughs> the talk is uh, like already over. Oh, there's one over here. All right, can I do this? <coughs> <laughs> yeah, that was it. Thank you very much for the talk. So if I understand, you measure stylization in terms of minimalism or exaggeration, correct? Yeah. Um, just so I understand where you're coming from, you use Spider-Man as an example. Um, the Spider-Punk in the recent uh, Spider-Verse film, where would he sit on the scale that you measure stylization with? Do you mean the uh, stylized one that came a few years ago? The film that came out um, earlier Like the this animated year. movie? Yeah, the character who is um, made of collage. They animated a character using a collage style. I'm not sure if you know the character, but I'm I curious. think I do, but there's so many Spider-Man movies by now, so I'm like, which animated one? But uh, yeah, if you're talking about the one that had a very specific art representation, then, uh, then I know about it. Right. But uh, the thing with stylization is that it can go in any direction. It's clearly stylized because it's not realistic, so we can at least, you know, count on that. But when it comes to, like, dividing them into certain categories, 
I would place it in the exaggerated categories because it's not like flat colors or removing a lot of details. They're actually exaggerating shapes and the way they're animating and having the effects as well. So like, if you only had those categories, I would definitely move it into the exaggerated one, if I have a clear picture in my mind on what you're talking about. All right, thank you. All right, any more questions? We've still got a few minutes left. Um, I have one, actually. Um, do you, this is a very programmer question, so I'm a programmer. But do you ever use anything like an auto lod to kind of get an like to get an idea of where you would go with stylization? Like if you take a very real model and then sort of auto lod it to get rid of some of the details? So uh, I c yeah, sometimes if I have something, or like if you scanned, because that's also like something people do a lot with video games today, like photogrammetry. If you do have something, then it's very simple in like ZBrush, which is my favorite uh, software to use as well, to start removing a lot of the details and just dragging in the shapes. Uh, and then you can do multiple copies and see what happens with the, with the model. But the hard thing with that can also be that you're too focused on the original as well, instead of like creating something uh, like starting super simple and see how you can push it towards realism. But if you're going for that in between, it's a good way of um, seeing where that in between lands. Awesome, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, over here. Do you want to try throwing it, Molly? I'll do the best. <laughs> okay, ready? Also, first try. That was beautiful. <laughs> Uh, what are your ideas for uh, choosing uh, whether you go for stylized or um, realistic? And uh, what type of games um, is it more effective to choose one uh, over the other? Wow. Well, that is uh, like almost a subject that you, someone can have a talk about in itself. It's a good question, though, and that's something where everyone is in the beginning, right? When you're choosing the art style for something. But uh, like, as I started with game design and then move into art, I must say that my way of thinking is more catered towards game design in this sense. So I would always think about the game first and the target audience and all of those things that you put on a paper uh, before trying to play on which style I would go for, uh, because it's very expensive to just do both of them and see where you're going, right? So I would say that's how I usually start. So if it's like, well, it's for kids, well, probably a lot of parents would be more happy to put, you know, a stylized game in the kid's hand than a realistic one. And if you're making something more for adults, usually it's, uh, at least in the Western world, you view, like, the stylization more cartoony for kids, and then you want to have something realistic. So that's usually, like, where you end up when you're choosing something, the, basically the target for, for the game. But then, of course, you can start playing around with, as many of these games do, like enhancing things, even when you're a realistic game. If you want to push it in a certain direction, more vibrant or more like cold, uh, like less saturated, or with stylization, you can almost go anywhere as well. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. All right. I think if there's no more questions, we'll uh, stop that one there. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, nice work. <laughs> well done.